Hey everyone, what's up? My name is Erica Anderson, Erica America on Twitter. Um, thank you, by the way, for your service doing this signing. Um, so I'm going to talk about engineering trust in the digital news age. This is me. Um, I've worked at Twitter and now Google. I started off just trying to be a journalist. I worked at MTV News and CBS News, and I've spent my career focused on this question of um, the tension between old and new media, and actually how do we bring the best of old media, journalism, integrity, ethics, fact-checking, verification, into this new world, which is ever-changing and complicated. So I work at Google, and I'm on this team called the Google News Lab, and Google's mission is to organize the world's information and to make it universally accessible. And if you think about that, the idea is, or we believe, Google believes, that a more informed world will lead to better outcomes. And at the very heart of that mission, um, I'm biased because I love journalism, but I think a lot of people agree. Some of the most important kind of information is journalism, is quality news. And quality journalism has never been more important. Things are changing um, at unprecedented rates. The world is changing. And just for me, as someone who reads the news, when I read something about my community, when I know what's happening in the world, I feel more empowered. So I want to do three things with this talk. Number one, I want to implore you to be an avid, conscientious news consumer. Number two, I want to help you understand what journalists are up against today. And number three, I want to share what Google is doing to build the future of news and journalism. So listen, from every angle, the industry is changing. How many journalists do we have in the room, people who work in news? Cool, thank you so much for doing what you do. Um, so everything is changing. How we consume is totally changing. In the US, majority of adults, over 50% consume news on social media. In the developing world, they're consuming news on messaging apps and chat apps. Um, how it's formatted is totally changing. You can't just think about where people are going to consume it. You have to think about how you're going to produce it. So last year, voice activated devices like Google Home and Amazon Alexa totally outstripped and outpaced smartwatches, which is good because I never bought one. Um, <laughs> And how we pay is changing. People are actually beginning to like, show a willingness to pay for news, which is pretty cool. Um, after the US election, there was something that's called the Trump bump. Um, the New York Times, for example, increased. Uh, they actually had half a million more digital subscribers in the six months after the US election, which is actually pretty cool. I pay for news, too. Who pays for news? Yes! Right on. It's important. Um, it's also hot, so thank you. Um, <laughs> So trust in media, we can't talk about this subject without talking about this elephant in the room, which is trust in media is at an all-time low. Um, there are new journalistic challenges. The web and the internet has made it easier than ever to get information, but it's also opened up the ability for misinformation to spread at an unprecedented rate. It's made it more difficult for journalists to verify original sources. And people just don't trust the news. So in this huge survey that was done last year by the Reuters Institute, or actually a few months ago, they interviewed 70,000 people around the world in 36 countries, and they asked them if they trust the media. Less than half of them said they do. And this increased, the level of this increased in, the more, in more polarized countries like the US, Italy, and Hungary. But the worst thing, actually, for me when I read this was that a third of those people actively avoid the news, which is bad news, because when you don't read the news and you don't know what's happening in your world, you feel less empowered, you feel less engaged. And then there's new nomenclature that's happening, this term fake news, which I actually won't use, but I'm only going to use it to explain to you in a little bit what it is. Um, that's being used to make people wonder, is fake news when an article based on reporting is just something I don't agree with? Is that fake news? Or is it like a manipulated or doctored photo that's meant to deceive me? And the problem of misinformation is only going to get more complicated. With the rise of CGI and AI and the ability to manipulate photos and videos and literally put words in people's mouths, we're going to be in a totally new world where journalists are going to have to have skills and the ability and the technology to verify faster. And consumers of news are going to have to have a scrutiny around what they're seeing. So how do we engineer trust in digital news? I'm not going to sit here and tell you it's a silver bullet and that we've figured it all out, but I do think we, amongst other platforms and with partners, are working on some important solutions to get us there. I love this quote, engineering is not the art of building devices, it's, or it's not the art of building devices, it's the art of fixing problems. And fixing problems is what we do at the Google News Lab. So my team is dedicated to bringing the industry together, and we do it in four ways. First, we convene. Kind of like this, it's really important to bring people together. We believe that we have an important role to play in the news industry to bring leaders together to collaborate on solutions. 
We also build products. We work with Google engineers and Mountain View and around the world to help build better tools for journalists to do things like verification. We train people. Last year, we trained 25,000 journalists around the world in person and 150,000 online to use new skills to inquire, to use new tools to acquire new skills. And we, research, we do research. We support institutions around the world to do important independent research that can help us all understand what's happening. This is one of those things. I'm going to give you a few examples of how we do this. Uh, we work with this group called the First Draft Coalition. They're based out of Harvard. They're absolutely amazing. And they are a coalition put together to fight misinformation and to train journalists about new skills that are needed. And they just came out with this article um, that's called Seven Types of Mis and Disinformation. When I talked about fake news, I actually want to give us some language around this. So misinformation is the inadvertent sharing of, of information you don't realize is, is incorrect. Disinformation is this very specific intentional sharing, like propaganda of information that's not real. And First Draft came out with this guide for journalists about how to spot mis and disinformation, which is important because once they understand what they're looking for, they can get better at verifying and debunking it. So up on the top right, um, that photo of the Statue of Liberty under distress, that's actually a real photo. It was on a movie poster the day after tomorrow. Um, and it was used during Hurricane Sandy. Someone put an NY1 car on it and it went viral. And people thought that it was real. It wasn't. The other example is just straight up fabricated content. Pope Francis shocks the world and endorses Donald Trump. Not true at all. The other thing we're doing is we're actually behind these collaborative journals and projects, which are actually the coolest things. So we actually are building pop-up newsrooms around elections, because elections are moments where misinformation can spread before the election and certainly during the election on voting day. And so we built this pop-up newsroom uh, on election day here in the US at CUNY. And we worked with ProPublica, WNYC, and Univision. And we brought all these journalists together with the very specific focus of debunking misinformation by using social media and technology to identify issues that were happening around the US, verifying it, traditional journalism. So we have people over here catching it, using uh, tools and technology, looking at all 50 states. When they found something that happened, they would send it to catchers. The catchers would verify it. And then journalists would report on it and send the information out to newsrooms around the country. And why does this matter? Because stuff like this um, is sent out, right? Trying to keep people away from the polls, telling them they should vote the day before. This is why journalists matter, because they are on our side to try and verify and help correct this information to make sure democracy can function. The other way we're trying to engineer trust um, is through this idea of structured data. And this is where coding comes in. So we do these collaborative journals and projects. We're learning to define what misinformation is. Um, but a lot of journalists, so Google News has 80,000 publishers that uh, can produce content for Google News. And we just launched something called the fact check tag. The fact check tag is basically when any of these publishers are creating a fact check story. So they're taking a statement that a mayor said or the president said or a statistic that's going viral and they fact check it. And then they use a line of code to tell us through their CMS that this is a fact check. And then Google can surface it. And we surface it on search, and we surface it on Google News. And basically what that means for you and I when we read it is we see a little tag that says fact check. So this is like the beginning, and I think it's super interesting, the beginning of us trying to create more signals that people, so that people can understand um, what they're reading and what went into it. Because media literacy is at an all-time low. This is the other big uh, collaborative project we're doing with the Trust Project. The Trust Project is a group of 60 news organizations around the world. They got together. They basically wanted to define like the 45 ingredients that go into creating journalism that a platform wouldn't necessarily know about. So does this news organization have a code of ethics? How are they funded? Um, what kind of article is this? Is it an op-ed? Is it sponsored content? Is it straight reporting? And so they've come up with this list of indicators that they're now turning into schema and code so that they can use. Um, so anyone, anyone can mark up their articles with this content. And then any platform that's invested in using the open web, meaning we can all have similar standards through structured data, can utilize that and use it to help consumers understand what they're reading. So listen, how do we engineer trust in digital news? I'd say that, like I said, it's not a silver bullet. There's a lot of work to be done. But I'm eternally optimistic. Um, it's important work. I'm passionate about it. And I think all these different ingredients I'm talking about ultimately come together to get us there. 
But I would just say this, I would implore you all to be conscientious and avid news consumers, to support or pay for local news, get engaged. If you don't think something's being covered, call your local news organization or, or engage with the reporter. And I would say, will you help us build the future? If you have ideas, please find me. Um, we don't think all the best ideas, we know the best ideas aren't gonna come from us, they're gonna come from you and from the community. So that's it, thank you so much.